My dearly beloved in Christ, this morning's epistle is taken from a wonderful book of the Bible, the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles was written by St. Luke, and it details the life of the early church from the ascension of our Lord up until the imprisonment of St. Paul. At any rate, it tells the story in chapter 2 of Pentecost, how the Holy Ghost came down upon the apostles the tenth day after our Lord ascended into heaven, after they had made that first novena, nine days of prayer, and then on Sunday morning, Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came down in a marvelous way. The house was shaking. A sound was heard, wind, violent wind. And all of the sudden there appeared to them, that would mean our Blessed Mother and the Apostles and the various disciples that were there in the upper room, there appeared tongues of fire resting on the head of each one of them. And they were transformed filled with the Holy Ghost and strengthened in order to spread the faith. They came forth from that upper room and now they were very different men indeed. St. Peter, who trembled at the word of a servant girl outside the house of Caiaphas, and all the apostles who were afraid and terrified such that they barred shut the doors of the room where they were staying, now all of the sudden came forth bravely and they preached the faith. And so great was their preaching, so effective, that on that first day of the life of the church, there were baptized 3,000 persons. I would like to read a little bit and this is also taken from chapter 2 of the Acts of the Apostles, of the first sermon given by St. Peter. In fact, this would be taken from Wednesday of this week, the uh, Mass of Ember Wednesday. And the reading from the Acts of the Apostles says, and this is a continuation of what we just read in today's Mass, of how the Holy Ghost came down and they went out and preached and all the people were saying, are not all these that are speaking Galileans? And how have we heard each in his own language in which he was born? And of course, that was the gift of tongues that the Holy Ghost gave the apostles to enable them to spread the faith. And these are the words of the first sermon of St. Peter. Men of Judea, and all you who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says the Lord, that I will pour forth of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And moreover, upon my servants and upon my handmaids in those days will I pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the day of the Lord comes the great and manifest day. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This again is taken from the first sermon of St. Peter in which he quoted from a prophet in the Old Testament, Joel the prophet, on the changes that would come upon men as a result of the coming of the Holy Ghost. Our Lord had told the apostles before his ascension, it is necessary that I depart from you. And why? Because had our Lord not left, the Holy Ghost would not have come. Our Lord had his particular mission to fulfill. And as he said on the cross, it is consummated. In other words, he completed everything that his Father gave him to do. And now was the reign we might say, of the Holy Ghost 
in the church. And the Holy Ghost continues. The Holy Ghost we call the soul of the church. And the Holy Ghost continues to inspire, to enlighten, to bring about conversions by His grace. And it is indeed wonderful, the operation of the Holy Ghost in the church down through the centuries. We see it in the lives of the saints. We see it in the conversion of pagans. We see it in the work of the church of teaching and spreading the faith. And the Holy Ghost also works in us. We received him for the first time at baptism. And the catechism tells us that at baptism, we receive the life of grace, sanctifying grace, original sin is washed from the soul. But together with the life of grace, the Holy Ghost brings to the soul his seven gifts and the infused virtues. Now we've heard of these gifts of the Holy Ghost. We probably even memorize them in grade school. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, fear of the Lord. But where do we get these gifts from? And by, by that I mean, where do we find the names of them in Scripture? It comes from the Old Testament. To be exact, the book of Isaiah the prophet, chapter 11. And he is talking about the coming Messiah. Isaiah had predicted many things about the future Messiah. And here he says, there shall come forth a rod out of the root of Jesse, and a flower shall rise up out of his root, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of fortitude, the spirit of knowledge and of godliness. And he shall be filled with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge according to the sight of the eyes, nor reprove according to the hearing of the ears, but he shall judge the poor with justice, etc. Godliness, it mentions, which another translation gives it as piety. So what are these seven gifts then? Well, first of all, they are just that. They are gifts. In other words, they are powers which God grants that we don't deserve, but given to us by his mercy and goodness. And I would like to go through them briefly to explain what each of these gifts does for the soul. And we'll start with the last gift, the fear of the Lord. And that is a very wonderful gift. Yes, there is a fear of hell, a fear of God's just punishments, but that's what we do, not what we mean here. This is a fear that is a reverential love and respect for Almighty God, a hatred of sin, a dread of committing even a small sin because it offends God who is so great, who is so good, who is so deserving of love. And so the fear of the Lord is a wonderful thing. And as it says in scripture, it is the beginning of wisdom. So we must have this fear. It is a good thing. And second, something that is goes along with that fear is the gift of piety. The gift of piety is a gift which gives us a loving respect towards God and everything that pertains to God. So it affects how we treat in a religious way, in a reverent way, the word of God, Holy Scripture, the things that pertain to God, the liturgy, the sacraments, uh, the church building, the statues, sacramentals, everything that pertains to God, persons consecrated to God, and so forth. So the gift of piety gives us that respect in our treatment of all the things that pertain to Almighty God. The next I would like to cover two gifts that are sometimes misunderstood, and that is understanding and knowledge. What is the difference between them and what do they pertain to? Understanding is the gift by which we see the beauty of and appreciate the truths of our faith. We have an understanding of Scripture. We cannot fully comprehend the mysteries of our faith, such as the mystery of the Trinity, but we see the reasonableness of the truths of our faith, their interconnectedness. And we have 
a sense of appreciation for the truths of God, the truths that God has revealed, the truths of our faith. Knowledge, on the other hand, is the gift which helps us to understand or perceive the value of creatures. So the gift of understanding, the truths revealed by God, the gift of knowledge to see the things of this world for what they really are, what they are really worth. We look upon created things as given to us by God so that we can serve him, that we can serve him properly in this world. But we realize their emptiness, that they are not ends in themselves. And how foolish are those of the world who seek only after the things of this life and not the things of eternity. So knowledge gives us that important understanding about the things of this world and their relation to God and to our souls. It also gives us um, the, the, what we sometimes call infused knowledge, which was given to many of the saints, some who were unlettered, hadn't learned how to read and write, and yet had a deep understanding. And these are the gifts both of knowledge and of understanding. Also an important gift, the gift of counsel, helps us to choose to make the right decisions. The Holy Ghost guiding, influencing our understanding and our will so that we see what we should choose in, its, in the relation of our choices to our ultimate end, eternity with God. So counsel is an, an important gift. Also very important in these days, the gift of fortitude. Now there is the virtue of fortitude, but the gift of fortitude is a supernatural strength that comes to us, especially when our faith is tested, when we are put in a difficult or find ourselves in a difficult situation. We are given that strength, that fortitude to stand up for our faith, to be willing and ready even to die for it if necessary. And we see that fortitude in the apostles where they came forth bravely and they went forth, they traveled throughout the world and spread the faith and they counted it, scripture tells us, they counted it a blessing from God to have something to suffer for God. And they were willing to lay down their lives, which ultimately they did. And then finally we come to the highest, the greatest of the gifts, which is the gift of wisdom. And we know the difference when we say that someone is very brilliant or intelligent on the one hand, but then the difference between that knowledge or intelligence and wisdom. Wisdom is something that is gained from experience and is a real appreciation of what really matters in life. Ultimately, the salvation of our souls. So the wisdom is looked upon as the highest gift. It is God giving us a value, uh, a, an ability to value things for their true worth, to realize what really matters. Now we think of these seven gifts. They are powers of the Holy Ghost that are given to the, to the souls of those in the state of grace to help them to get to heaven. We should value them. We should pray for an increase of the gifts of the Holy Ghost again, which help us on our path through this life. We see it in the saints, we see it in the apostles, and we see it in the church down through the centuries. There was a holy cardinal who was asked, and I mentioned this story before, who was asked, what was his secret? How did he come at such a knowledge and uh, holiness, etc.? And his reply was, well, all I can think of is that I have prayed to the Holy Ghost every day. Every morning in my morning prayers, I pray to the Holy Ghost to strengthen me, to enlighten me, to help me, to help me to do the will of God, to live a good Catholic life. And often, unfortunately, the Holy Ghost is forgotten. There has even been given a name to the Holy Ghost of the forgotten guest, because he is the guest of our souls. We are, by grace, temples of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, he dwells within us. But how many Christians think about, remember the indwelling 
of the Holy Ghost in the soul, how often he is forgotten. Let us then remember to pray to the Holy Ghost, to ask often for a greater share in his gifts, which are so valuable and so helpful to us in living our faith, practicing our faith. And let us especially be faithful to the inspirations of the Holy Ghost. He is striving, he is leading us to God. But oftentimes we are deaf to his inspirations, to the promptings of grace that come from the Holy Ghost. Let us cooperate. Let us use these gifts and graces to sanctify ourselves, to become the saints that God wants us to become. The Holy Ghost will enable us to do that if we do our part. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.